Sorry, Esther. I said Ezra. I meant Esther. Sorry. Just really coming pretty close to the end of the book of Esther. And uh, then we're going to be going into Psalms, which I really enjoy. And that will be there. Or Job. And then Psalms. Uh, and for Job, we'll probably do something a little bit different this time. We'll probably uh, do more of an overview rather than a verse by verse for Job. But we'll talk about that as we get to it in a few weeks. So. Um, but anyway, tonight, Esther, so I get it correct, chapter 7, Esther chapter 7, and let's go before the Lord in prayer, and we'll start at verse 1. Father, now as we gather together, Lord, we ask that you would move in our hearts and our midst, Lord. Just open your word to us, Lord. Speak to us as you're so faithful to do by your Holy Spirit, Father, in our midst, Lord, uh, for we love you and we want to worship you and grow closer to you. So do that great work, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Esther chapter 7 is where we find ourselves. And, um, you you know, we we remember the book of Esther was very unusual because remember the they had already been allowed to go back, you know, uh, to the land, uh, promised land and rebuild. And there was a number of of people of, of Jews or Israelites that didn't go back and again we don't really know the numbers because it's you know you can kind of just assume based on a a few things it probably come up with a pretty close number but i don't i'd be guessing if i told you the percentage but i would assume that it's uh i I don't know i've heard some numbers but i think it's a very small percentage certainly probably under 10 percent or less of the people uh maybe even quite a bit less than that but went back to the land the rest of them were happily established in some sense in the babylonian kingdom and then eventually the medo-persian empire and then the medes kind of fell out and the persians kind of really ruled the the whole thing and uh, you know we're kind of in the midst of that that persian rule um so this would be the second persian ruler xerxes and um uh as he's going through, uh, and, and, and again, the Persian Empire was bigger than the, the Syrian, than the Babylonian, uh, by quite a bit. Um, only the Greek Empire will be bigger, but, uh, and that just because it was more, moved a little bit more into uh, Europe, and Alexander did go a little further east as well. But uh, not leaps and bounds bigger, but it was certainly bigger. So this is the world ruling empire at the time. And again, there's Jews in the capital city, which is where Esther and her her adopted uh, dad, if you would, really was her cousin, um, you know, uh, was raising her since a little one because her parents died, and presumably his family died at some point, and they were together, which was great. But again, the Bible, uh, the book doesn't mention prayer or uh, the word of God or God's name in any way. Uh, It doesn't talk about the sacrifices, the temple, the land of Israel. Really, it doesn't talk about any of that. And uh, again, it's it's like, you know, the Lord's moved out of the picture completely uh, as far as the text goes in the book of Esther. But what we see more importantly, I believe one of the important things that the Lord wants us to to see through this is that he is working behind the scenes just like he's working behind the scenes today and I, I've said it a number of times he works supernaturally naturally you know, there's so much of the time the Lord's working in our lives we just think oh that's what happened or oh, okay this uh, you know I, I that guy missed hitting me uh, you know when I was changing lanes or that thing almost you know got me or this thing great thing happened or this or that and I think we can tell pretty oh I didn't put it on YouTube Ethan that was my fault you want to start it Um, you know uh, again we just see him working through all that and sometimes we think oh that just happened or didn't happen or we were spared this or that and the reality of it is the Lord working and I believe that's one of the great messages that we have um, in the book of Esther so just so where we kind of catch up to where we've been um, leading up to this point, remember way back when uh, Esther was made queen. And then not too long after that, her, her, her dad Mordecai thwarted an assassination a- a- attempt against the king. 
and it was found out, it was true and everything, but he was never rewarded. He wasn't recognized for, for anything that he did, even though he was essential in, in keeping the king alive, really. Of course, it was all part of God's plan. Then the man Haman came on the set. He hates Mordecai for not bowing to him. Haman was elevated to the number two man in the empire. Uh, you know, very powerful, uh, you know, probably the second most powerful man in the world at that time, arguably. And again, he uh, doesn't like Haman, or I'm sorry, he doesn't like Mordecai because he doesn't bow down to him and have reverence for him like everybody else did. And we spent a lot of time talking about how that went down and why, uh, or at least what we think why in, in earlier chapters. And so it, it angered him so much, and he had so much anger and bitterness and rage, really, that he got the king kind of unknowingly to... Uh, issue orders to kill all the Jews in all of the Persian Empire, which would have included all those that went back with Joshua and Zerubbabel, you know, and were building the temple, and all those guys, it would have got rid of Ezra, um, you know, uh, uh, everybody else that was around. I don't know how old Ezra was, probably pretty young by then, but it would have gotten rid of everybody. Everybody. And... Um, you know, the king went along with it, and but he didn't, I don't think, you know, Haman never said he wanted to kill the Jews. He just said there's a people. He never identified who that group was, and it's pretty sad that the king didn't even inquire anything more than that. He kind of just trusted his number two man that if these guys should be gone, then they should be gone. Well, we know that once that came out, Esther went bravely before the throne, risking her life um, to ask for an audience with the king. And so, you know, when the king says yes, uh, spares her life because nobody was supposed to go in unannounced, uh, she, he said, what do you want? And she said, I'd like for you and Haman to come to dinner tonight. And sure enough, he says, yeah, you got it. And so he shows up, uh, you know, at the end of chapter six with Haman and they're there at the dinner. And, uh, you know, then he asks his queen, well, what do you want? What do you want? up to half my kingdom again a pretty blank check and the answer was uh well would you come to dinner tomorrow night you and Haman and so you know the king went away and I imagine he was just scratching his head and Haman was very happy that he was there because he was the only guest besides the king which would you know give him great recognition and obviously certainly work on his ego so we left off with her inviting them back the next night, and we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 7, and it says, So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day, uh, at the uh, banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half, my, half the kingdom it shall be done. Now, again, you know, we see how the Lord is working in the heart of this king because, you know, he goes home after the first night. And again, remember, he, they didn't have the same house. They didn't share the same room or, or even probably the same building from what we read here. So he went back. She went back. And then, you know, he's like, what does she want? What does she want? What does she want? What does she want? Now, we know that, you know, just a little prior to this, um, Mordecai, um, the king had couldn't sleep one night, a couple nights prior to this, and you know he was reading over his history. And remember, Mordecai discovered that he was never rewarded for um, saving the king, and so you know Mordecai is kind of on his head, and Esther certainly is wanting to know what her request is, and you know now he's really worked up. Okay, what do you want? And and I, again, I like that because Esther waited for the right time. You know, she knew that's what the Lord wanted to do, but she also waited for the time where he would open the door. And I think that's a very important lesson, as we talked about last time, too. Um, but again, maybe put yourself in this situation. You have the most powerful man, arguably, in the world at that time, certainly within, you know, a thousand miles-ish. Uh, you know, the most powerful man... Uh, the most richest man, and his, he is desired to, and wants to know her request so that he might grant it, even up to the point of like, I'll give half of you, half of my stuff. 
And again, we have to think about this. It's, it's, it, it, it just shows the hand of God working. Because remember, back in those days, even as it is in some countries today, sadly, that women weren't counted as much. You know, they were considered, as they are in some places today, more, more or less like property. And, uh, you know, certainly second-class citizens. And so we need to think about that for, for uh, you know, uh, somebody like powerful like him who had probably hundreds, if not thousands of women in his harem, uh, you know, to, to want to do something like that. It, w- it was very, very unusual. And here she is sitting there with the king eager to do whatever she asks. Now, again, um, the king remembers that Mordecai had, it had spared him and he was honored not but a few days earlier than that and saved his empire. So, you know, all that's kind of going around in his mind because the Lord made all that happen in a perfect time. And so he asked the queen, what do you want? Verse 3, then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king... Let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. (laughs) She's really laying it on there, huh? And we, uh, had we been sold as male and female slaves, well, I, I would have held my tongue. Although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So he sits down and says, what do you want, honey? And, you know, she says, I have a death sentence on me. That's why I'm doing all this. Me and, and those that I love and all those uh, that are, uh, you know, part of the group of people where I come from, the nation where I come from, they're all under a, a death sentence. And if it was anything less than the death sentence, I wouldn't even have bothered you. You know, if we had just been, you know, enslaved in some special way, even though they were pretty much enslaved, uh, uh, at least in part, uh, they were beholden to the king. She, she said, you know, if it would have been something like that, I, you know, I would have just let it slide. Uh, it would, you know, I, I would have let it slide, even though if you did that, it would have cost you. You know, it would have been not good for the kingdom. But I, I am doing this and I'm desperate because... Um, An enemy, uh, as it says at the end of verse uh, 4 there, the enemy could never compensate the king. So she names Haman as the enemy. Notice that. And this enemy, though he talks the talk about how good this is, it would be very detrimental, not only just because I would lose my life and those that I love and all my people, but it it would be detrimental to you as well. And I don't know about you, but if you're an underliner or a highlighter in your, in your Bible, I just think the enemy, you know, that's a good, good word to, to remember there, you know, because we have the same enemy appearing in other Hamans, you know, in the world today. We do. Uh, there's Hamans that are uh, being used by the enemy, and whether influenced or directly possessed by the enemy and his minions, uh, you know, they're out there and they want to destroy. And of course, we know the New Testament talks a lot about what he does and how he seeks to destroy and divide and tear up and uh, nothing good. In fact, when we get to Job next next book here in a couple, in a week or two or so, um, you know, we'll see that um, when the enemy, Satan, gives gets a little bit of a leash from from the Lord to do something, you know, he's right on it, right on it, and just destroys up to the very line that the Lord has drawn. You know, doesn't pull back a little bit, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, we'll do it, this will be miserable enough. It's not like that ever. It is full tilt up to where the Lord literally stops him. And as soon as he has another opportunity, and, and again, poor old Job is down. I mean, he lost all seven of his children, he lost every possession he had. He, he had lost everything. I mean, completely wiped out in a matter of seconds, really, because the messengers came one after another. And, and as soon as, you know, he wasn't satisfied with that. He goes to the Lord and the Lord says, okay, you, you can do this much more, but, you know, 
yet to stop here at taking his life. And, and Job is down. I mean, he's down and out, most of us would say, and yet Satan's going to be back there kicking him when he's down. And we just have to remember that. He is looking to destroy, and when you're down, he's not happy. Oh, good, you know, you're down, you're, you're you know, out for right now. You know, he's not happy with that. He's going to kick until, you know, he can't kick anymore, literally. But the great thing is, that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. And so now he's being exposed. And so verse 5 tells us, So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Well, who is he? And where is he? And who dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? You can hear the rage and anger building up in uh, Xerxes here. You can hear him saying, what? Who is he? And where is he? And how in the world could he presume to do such a thing? <laughs> now, can you imagine? Because Haman's sitting right there. Again, as I said, you have to... Esther, you know, brings him right into the midst. And she knew what the Lord had said and or I believe had the Lord had led her, I should say, not what he said, but, you know, to have him there, uh, to do all this in the setting that, that, you know, that he moved her into. But uh, you can imagine Haman was swallowing, you know, his, <laughs> his stomach was hurting and he gives a big, you know, and his mouth goes dry and he is, you know, his arms are probably starting to shake and his heart is pounding because he knows he's behind all this. And he hears the king's rage, which is, again, uh, we said this last time, you know, Haman was the number two man in the kingdom. I believe he was far, far and a far away, far and above, I should say, closer to Haman than he ever was the king to, to Esther. That's just the way things worked. Remember before Esther went in to just to invite him to dinner, she hadn't seen him in a month. You could bet the king was seeing Haman every day and probably most part of every day. So it was a, you know, I imagine she wasn't sure how he would respond to that because Haman probably pretty much ran the kingdom for the king. You know, that's what the number two guy does. He, he does that. So, you know, he could have easily have said, you know, well, that's my number two guy. Sorry, you know, uh, he's the guy I depend on. He runs everything, you know, I, I know him and, and all this. So there was, we have to remember all that. But he was mad and we can see, obviously, the Lord moving in his heart. And verse six says, and Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. So you can imagine, well, who is it? Where is he? Who would do such a thing? And she said, it's that guy. Imagine her pointing her finger. He is this adversary. He is working against us. He is the enemy and he is wicked. And again, I, I imagine her pointing her finger right at him. And uh, again, she, he is now at this point, obviously terrified because he sees the king's mad and his position, though, again, the, probably one of the closest people to him and one of the most respected people, certainly by him at least and, and, and every else in the kingdom, now all of a sudden realizes that he's got the king's wrath and the fingers pointing at him. Verse 7 says, Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. So the king, and I kind of like this about the king, you know, his, he's, he's, he's mad. I mean, he's boiling over. And rather than just, you know, let that happen, you know, he steps outside to cool off a little bit, takes a little walk and you know, tries to get his anger under control, which, you know, I think is pretty admirable for this admirable, admirable for this pagan king. You know, he, he does that. You know, he is very upset and he takes a break and he goes out to, you know, to cool off a little bit. And, you know, it's what um, Proverbs um, 
1632 says, you know, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And I always like that proverb because it pretty much says, right, you know, if you can control your temper, you know, that makes you incredibly strong. And, you know, if you can control that anger in your spirit, you know, you're, you're stronger than a guy who could take a whole city, right? That, that's how important it is. That's how difficult it is, but that's how powerful it is to control those things. And uh, he's doing that, and he goes outside, and Haman, of course, is there. The finger is just pointed at him. He sees the king's mad. He's willing to do whatever Esther wants. He goes outside, so Haman now is just, you know, on this mode of how can I survive this? You know, he's pleading, as it says, for his life from the queen. Maybe she can change things. Now, remember, it just, you know, just the day before, uh, Haman was on top of the world. He had money. He invited his friends over and his family and said, look how powerful I am. I have the most money. I have big family. I'm so respected in the kingdom. I'm the number two guy, you know, uh, I got, I was the only one invited to this special banquet and he was going on and on. And all of a sudden, look how the Lord turned things almost just in a day and really almost in an instant, quite frankly. Now he is pleading for his life. And verse eight says, when the king returned from the palace garden, to, play, uh, to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? And as, as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. <laughs> now you have to, you know, get this. Remember Haman, as I said, was just on top of the world and had everything. He literally did. He wasn't happy with that. He wasn't satisfied with this. He wanted to get even with Mordecai for not showing him respect. And not just Mordecai, he determined to get rid of every Jew because of one man's actions, Mordecai, which, as I see it, weren't weren't wrong at all. And yet now, in just an instant, when he's pleading for Esther, and he probably goes over to where she is, right? The place where she's sitting down. And, you know, it's a banquet of wine. So they're drinking, certainly, and, you know, presumably that's having an, in, an influence on him. And he gets over there, you know, to get closer to her, to probably, you know, get down on his knee or at least plead or something. He trips over something and he lands on top of the queen right when the king is coming back in <laughs> to the building there. He sees Haman on top of the queen and, you know, maybe he's thinking if I, you know, he's maybe trying to kill the queen or assault the queen in some way because she's accusing him of this. I I don't know what he's thinking because it doesn't tell us, but everybody around him, i.e. the bodyguards, right, his bodyguards, you know, they just cover his face, you know, uh, that's it, sign of that's it. But again, what? Is it in Facebook? Yes. Let's just leave it going, Ethan. Um, so, um, you know, rather, uh, we, we can just see, again, we need to know this, that it wasn't a coincidence, not a random happening. It wasn't karma in some way, or there wasn't, you know, some kind of luck or anything else. It was the Lord. The Lord set all this up, put every piece together so that, the king would know and see and that his people would not only survive, but as we'll see, that they'll prosper. That was the Lord protecting his people. And we need to understand and see that. It's so important because, you know, at this point you think, wow, great, great timing and how this all happened and the king responded this way and he happened to trip on her and he walked in and, you know, they came to dinner and he, accept, you know, leaned out the gold scepter to let her come in and all those kind of things. It was the Lord protecting his people. And again, uh, all that, you know, uh, I read somewhere, somebody said that the Jews, uh, the rabbis, 
um, say that uh, that Gabriel the angel pushed Haman. <laughs> That's their little uh, little legend there, you know, to so that he would be on, you know, she would trip on top of Esther when the king came in. But but again, you can hear the death march when all of a sudden Haman, you know, is on top of her. He looks around. She's looking at him, and you know, the king walks in, and you know. Da, da. <laughs> you can hear the death march playing, right? Every round, everyone in the palace, these bodyguards, they just cover his head with a bag because they all knew it was over for evil Haman. God working behind the scenes, putting everything together. And it's not done yet. Verse 9, Now Harbana, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look! The gallows, 50 cubits high, that's 75 feet high, which Haman has made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. <laughs> I, I mean... You just see that. One of the eunuchs now, again, God working. Hey, this, and again, think of it not as a gallows like we do in the Old West where they throw a rope over and they hang you. You know, it, it, it was a, a, a pole that they impaled you on. That's what the, the uh, Assyrians did. Uh, and they also came up with crucifixion, by the way. Um, and so, but this is one of the things they do. It's probably a pole 75 feet high. And what they would do is impale a person you know, you've probably seen it in pictures or movies or TV where they impale something. And the idea is this is what's going to happen to you if you do whatever that person did. And, of course, 75 feet up, you know, he's probably above a lot of the buildings so that everybody could see. And that was Haman's whole desire when somebody suggested him to, to build that. And now the eunuchs, again, one of the king's servant just says, hey, he just did this. And the king said, yep, you're right. Let's take the very thing that Haman meant for harm and turn it back on him. And I, I can't emphasize you know, enough how this principle is taught so much in Scripture. You know, it's just repeated in so many lessons and so many things, you know, in Scripture. And I'll just give us a couple, you know, Psalm... Uh, 7, 14 through 16 says, He who is pregnant with evil and conceives trouble gives birth to disillusionment. He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. His violence comes down on his own head. So again, you know, those people that are intending things for evil, that are doing things for evil, that are working in this way and doing this, you know, it's going to catch up. And the Lord says there's a price to be paid for that. I, you know, I, I guess in my own life, I, I thought of that. I was, I was a young guy. I was probably, I, I don't know, 18, no, I was probably 19, maybe, maybe even 20 19, somewhere around that. I was a young guy, and I had spent a lot of my summers and a lot of my school year my, in my, when I was in high school rebuilding a car. And I had, you know, uh, it, it was a hot rod. It was a 37. I put a lot of time and effort and money into it, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but it came to a point when, you know, I couldn't keep it. Any, there wasn't a place for me to, to keep it anymore. And so I decided to sell it, and I... Remember to this day, uh, a guy up in uh, L.A., you know, this was when I was in Southern California, you know, came up from L.A. He was some slick business guy, wrote, drove this nice BMW down. And we had agreed upon a price, and he said, I'll, and I said, okay, great. And then we, uh, he said, you know, I'll send a tow truck down tomorrow, and we'll, I'll tow it, and it'll be at the, at, you know, meet you at the storage place at such and such time. So I'm great, I'm going over there, and then sure enough, you know, uh, we get there, you know, we, it's, it's kind of an emotional time for me. It's kind of hard to explain. I know it sounds kind of silly maybe to some of you, but uh, it, it was a little bit. And then this guy, you know, starts looking at the car one more. He goes, oh, the frame is bent. 
And I go, the frame is not bent. I've been through that car, taking things off to the frame. I know it's not bent. Yeah, it's bent, you know, this and that. And the tow truck is literally like running right here. And, uh, you know, here I am stuck, you know, I'm a kid, right? And, and this guy's probably in his thirties somewhere. And, you know, he, he just was a great, you know, he knew how to, how to run, you know, people obviously. And, you know, basically I, I had to take, you know, this, this discount on it and it really bothered me. And, and I always thought, even to this day, I think, you know what? He, he just knew how to take advantage of a younger guy and manipulate it so that he, you know, would just get this steal to his advantage in a very wrong way. I'm not saying we shouldn't get good deals or anything, but, you know, he was taking advantage in a, in a wrong way. And I always thought, you know, that guy someday, you know, he's going to, you know, have some of this stuff because I imagine I'm not the only man because he's obviously well practiced in that. You know, you, you do enough of that and it's going to come around and it's just, it's, you're going to pay a price for that. And it's taught so much in scripture. And of course, here's a perfect example of that. And, and Proverbs, uh, again, 26 says, if a man digs a pit at, at the Hamans, that'll come into our lives. And, you know, he seems like they're take, getting advantage and they're having everything go in their way and everything. And just, we need to know. And again, that's why the Lord tells us, vengeance is mine. Uh, not for you. Uh, you're just called to do what I've called you to do and allow me to take care of all that because one day I'm going to square up the books. It may not be in this day, uh, in, in this life. It might be in eternity. It might be both. We don't know, but, you know, he says, let me take care of it. You know, sometimes we, um, you know, we read these things that Jesus talks where he talks about, you know, turning the other cheek and going the extra mile and allowing this person to do this. And, you know, how I always look at that is to me is like, um, it, it kind of fits into this. It's like, listen, you're not called to get even and judge people or get back at people that are hurting you or abusing you or attacking you. You know, your job is just to love people and I will judge them. Don't worry, nobody is getting away with anything. And if they take advantage of you and are abusing you, I see that, I know that, I am gonna take care of it because you're mine. And you don't have to sweat that. You just love on people, you know? And not, not saying that we're a doormat for everybody, but I am saying that should be our heart rather than being, you know, getting even and I have to stick up for myself, I have to do all this kind of stuff. No, we can trust the Lord that He is going to work out everything for our good, he is going to watch out for us, and he's going to take care of it. And, you know, what Satan means to do for evil in our lives, he is going to turn around for good when the Hamans come and attack us. Remember, Joseph uh, was sold into slavery by his brothers, and then, you know, he got raised up and raised up, and he was the number two man, uh, you know, like Haman was, uh, you know, in Egypt. Of course, then his Brothers came eventually, you know the story in Genesis, and they came before him asking for food, and he reveals himself, and then, you know, some things go by, and eventually, you know, they're worried about him taking vengeance on him. And what does good old godly Joseph say is that, you know what, what, don't worry, you don't have to worry about it, for what you, you know, meant for evil, God turned it around it for good to save many people. And, you know, you, you, it saved many people. So that's just a great reassurance we have, and a great assurance, I should say, we have, that He's going to do that, that He loves us, and He's going to watch out for us. This is a great verse again, Isaiah 54, 17 says this. And, and if you like to write notes in your Bible, it's a good one to write next to this verse here and other verses. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And again, I, uh, I think that's important. He is watching us and nothing that comes against his people, his children, um, is going to prosper. And, and there's no way somebody's going to overcome physically or 
you know, and speaking and putting you down and using words, it's just, they're not going to have victory in the end. I'm going to take care of it. And I like this quote as we finish this chapter here. It said, any attempt of Haman to come against you and destroy you will not prosper. It might seem like it's going to. The gallows might be built. The noose might be readied. And you might think it's all over for you. But if you're a child of his, God will miraculously and faithfully turn it for good. And I think that's a good thing for us to remember because what was a day or two earlier, a death sentence for millions of people and certainly for the people that we're talking about here, Esther and Mordecai and others that were right here, now all of a sudden that whole thing is moved out of the way. The, the barrier, the obstacle, the one stirring up all the, all the trouble is gone. And Haman's got a bag over his head, and he's going to be placed on a 75-foot pike. Well, chapter 8. So the next thing the king did in verse 1 of chapter 8 says, On that day, King Azaharius, uh, and that's the title for king, that means king, you know, like uh, Pharaoh means king, gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. So Esther, you know, doesn't have much of anything. She comes from nothing with Mordecai. Seemingly, they don't have much at all. Uh, and certainly the Jews weren't considered much. And now has all this wealth, all his influence, and all his evil plans have crumbled to the ground in an instant. So she's given all that. And then, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told uh how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. <laughs> so, I, I mean, look at this. First of all, you know, Esther gets all this, but Mordecai's fresh on the king's mind. Just a couple of days earlier, he's reminded that he saved his life. And then Esther said, hey, by the way, that's my, my dad. That's your dad? Great, right? All of a sudden he's recognized. He, he's the one that saved my life. Again, perfect timing that the Lord's putting this all together. And, and you know, since she has all this, now she puts him in charge of all that she has. And again, he has a ton. He's the number two man in, in the country. He's in the, in the, I should say, the kingdom, uh, the empire. And so he has more than anybody other than the king. And so she puts him in charge of that. And then he also gives him this signet ring, which is giving him authority to make decisions as the number two man in the empire, just like Haman had. So not only is he giving uh, him authority, but he's giving him power. What a change from just a few days ago. I mean, an, an incredible change. And again, the Lord is working in and through all these things. And now Esther, verse 3, spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to uh, counteract the evil of Haman, the Agagite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther, so Esther arose and stood before the king. Now you might be scratching your head a little bit like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Mordecai is the number two guy. She's, he's now in charge of all this wealth and power that, that Esther has now that's been given to her. And it's great and wonderful, but the king's order to kill all the Jews in the 12th months still stands. And the king went back and probably didn't think that anybody was going to make a move on Esther or Mordecai because look what happened to Haman. But that's still hanging out there. And I don't know, you know, how long, it, you know, the time was between verse 2 and, and, and verse 3. I, I don't imagine it was much time. But Esther, again, risks her life to see the king. As we can see with that golden scepter being handed up, uh, uh, put towards her, that was to spare the life of somebody that came into the, the court of the king unannounced or uninvited. 
It was a death sentence and only him, he could stop it. You were, you were to be killed and only he could stop it to be intervened. There wasn't, oh, should we kill him, king? It, you were to be king and he could stop it by doing that. So she did the same thing again, risked her life. Uh, and, and again, uh, asked that this, you could do something to counteract what Haman was going to do. And, and so she's going to stand before him and say that, and he's going to say, okay, in verse 5, she'll continue, and said, if it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleased in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadath uh, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. provinces. Verse 6 says, For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? And, and so she goes in there, again, risking her life, and he allows her to speak, and she said, You know, honey, <laughs> I still have the death sentence on me, and uh, even though I believe I'll be spared because of who I am and, and those closest to me, probably Mordecai and maybe a few others, but there's still all the other Jews in all the empire and all those that are, went back to Jerusalem, went back to Israel and everybody else where they were scattered and they were scattered all over the place from the Assyrian Empire to the Babylonian Empire now to the, the Persian Empire. You know, they had been scattered all over the place there. And she says, you know, I, I can't stand by even though I'll be okay and allowing others to die. And I want, and I'm asking you to change what has been decreed. Now, remember, we've, we found from, we, we know from Daniel, we know from earlier in the book of Esther and a couple of places there in, in scripture that once a law was written in the Persian empire, the Medes and the Persian, it couldn't be changed. Remember Remember Daniel, wasn't they talked the king into not letting anybody bow down except before the king for 30 days. The king thought that was a great idea. Let's do that. Of course, they were trying to trap Daniel. Remember that story? And of course, they follow Daniel home. The first thing he does is pray. They said, you're busted. They take him before the king. Uh, king, he was praying, you know, the law you signed, uh, you can't do that. You know, the sentence was going to be death. And so, of course, uh, you know, the king was very upset, realized he'd been tricked. And he said, you know, Daniel, I can't change it. Um, you got to go in the lion's den. And of course, the Lord spared him. We know the story. So those kind of laws were in place. So this law written by the king could not be just say, I'll oh, cancel that. See you later. You know, it was one of the things that was written into their, their ruling, which made the Persian Empire, you know, not the same as a Babylonian, because remember Nebuchadnezzar could do anything, say anything, change everything, change it back. Uh, so with the Assyrians, so with the Pharaohs, but in their way of governing, you know, you made a law and it had a stick. Even the king couldn't change it like that. And so she's asking him to change it. Um, in verse 7, then King Ahasuerus, in response now, said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman and have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourself write a decree concerning the Jews as you please. And if you like to underline or highlight, I think that's a great thing to remember there. In the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So here it is. He hears her plead. She call, he calls in Mordecai, or Mordecai was in there. He probably was in there because he's the number two guy and he's probably you know, helping out the king and doing all that. And he call, you know, they're sitting there. Okay, uh, the king says to Mordecai, listen, you got my ring. When you seal it, you know, it, it becomes law. So you got that. And we can't reverse the first decree, but you can write another one. So you got everything you need to work this all out. He basically gives Mordecai a blank check. Do whatever you need to do to save and to spare your people. 
I mean, you just have to think about that. I mean, he's given a blank check. He's given you do whatever you need to do, whatever you think you should do to, to spare the people. You can do whatever you want. I mean, what an incredible opportunity to, to, to be used and, and to do these things. And, you know, I, I think it's good just to broaden this out a little bit. You know, what do we do with the opportunities the Lord has given to us? You know, there's times, and a, well, a lot of times, I should say, and, and we were going through this on 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning about having gifts, and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks and the gifts that the Lord gives us. But, you know, He's given us gifts as believers. He gives us opportunities, um, but do we take them? And when we do take them, are we always thinking of the common good for the name of Jesus and for the church as a whole? I mean, that's what we were talking about on Sunday, remember, with the spiritual gifts. They're, 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 they're given to edify, to build up the church, to you know, highlight the name of Jesus, to do those great works in God's people's lives. I mean, they're meant for the benefit, as we talked about on Sunday, for all. Now, Mordecai has got a lot of authority here. He could have done something just to cover himself, maybe cover some friends, some people in Susa, and they're like, you know, uh, this or that. I mean, he, he has this huge opportunity. Um, you know, what's he going to do with it? What he has the ability now to is he has the ability to send out a letter or, or you know, write a number of things that's going to go to, what, 126 provinces? I forgot how many there were. I think 126 provinces in that in that empire and you know he can have an influence over this whole empire by what he writes and what he does and you know what what's he going to do with it what's he going to do with this opportunity and let's read it in verse 9 so the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month which is the month of silva sylvan on the 23rd day and it was written according to all that mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia. 127, okay, I was close, 27 provinces in all. To every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Azuharius, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. So he now, and we know that the, the last law, they were, supposed to, they were allowed to kill the Jews. Now remember, uh, what got people to kill the Jews was not so much that his troops would go in, but the larger way of getting rid of him, remember, was to allow people that whoever you killed, you could keep their stuff. So if a Jewish family was a neighbor, you know, a, a neighbor of yours, let's say, and you lived in one of these provinces, you know, if you and the two neighbors got together and you killed that family, and literally, you, had, you know, you killed everybody from babies to the oldest people, right? You could take their house, you could take their car, you could take what was in their bank account, what was in there. I mean, you just, you can imagine it, it appealed to, the greed of people and especially uh, certainly the you know the evil people of the empire and you imagine there was a bunch of packs or gangs or cartels that were forming to get rid of the jews here and so now what mordecai does is we'll read here in a minute what what he writes but he sends this word out swiftly to everywhere so they can read this. And remember, it gets posted and then it gets read by a herald or so people that can't read can hear all this. It gives them to all the people in authority. And it was a, a huge task to write all these letters in different languages and, and then have them sent out and get to them in time uh, before the 12th month. And so they're spreading the word quickly. And again, I think we it's always good to be a messenger to spread the word out as well in our day and age. And so verse 11, by uh, these letters, the kings permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives. 
to destroy, kill, and annihilate all forces of any people or providence that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions on one of the days in all the providences of the king Azraharius on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. And a copy of this document was issued as a decree in every providence and published for all people, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers rode on royal uh, horses, went out, hastened and pressed by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel, so in the capital, if you would. So basically, Mordecai decreed that although the death sentence stood, the Jews had a right to band together and to defend themselves. And, and again, you know, if they, uh, uh, that same thing that, you know, okay, if you try to fight the Jews as they band together and you lose, you're going to lose everything. So they were going to risk a lot. So that, that, that was put out there so that they would, you know, risk a lot. Uh, they, there would be a lot they're risking if they were to attack the Jews. But again, you know, they had a death sentence on them. And I, I think, you know, it's important for us to just note here that, you know, guess who else has a death sentence on them because of sin? Well, we do. And just like the Jews in those days had a death sentence on them, we have a death sentence for our sin, but we also have the opportunity because what a second decree for life was issued through Jesus. You, you know, you, you see that, that great picture here in this story, right? He, he is, we have this death sentence because of our sin. God is just. And how do you solve the problem of a just and a righteous God who is perfectly just? You know, uh, this is a sin and it needs to be paid for. That's just, and God is completely and 100% just. So how does he solve the problem of people who need to pay for their sins because he's just without compromising that eternal decree and, and who he is, his eternal nature for justice? And so um, fulfilling that justice and taking that punishment that we deserved he issues this counter decree, as was issued here, and he saves us by having Jesus pay for our sins that you and I don't have to pay for our sins and that we might have life and live, eternal life. And that's a great picture in the story here. And the same thing is, you know, is going on. And... Uh, what a great thing to see in the Old Testament. People are like, ah, what do you read the Old Testament for? You know, it's just old stuff and this, that. Man, the Old Testament is so alive with so many great stories and so many great principles. And certainly we see that here. Well, let's finish this up. Verse 15. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susan rejoiced and was glad. And the Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. And I can imagine that they sure did. From a death sentence to now, we have, you know, this chance. And we'll get to it next time when we finish up the book, you know, about the great witness that Mordecai will become and how the Lord uses him in that position. We'll see that. But here, with about eight months or so, um, the battle would come. You know, there is this great sigh of relief here. But I also want us to note this before we, before we leave. You notice the second decree didn't keep them from the heat of the battle. But it gave them great hope in the battle. So it doesn't keep them from a battle, but it gives them great hope in the battle. Just like the Lord doesn't promise to us to keep us from the battle, from difficulty, or from trial, just as Jesus said. You know, Father, I pray that you don't, you know, not, not that you take them from this world, but that you would strengthen them, right? He tells us in John. He gives us great hope in battle because he gives us his promise, his presence, that he'll work everything out for good, that he's with us, 
As a matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 5 says this, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. For we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I'll say it as a statement rather than a question. But, right? What can they do? His promise is to never leave us or forsake us. And yes, there's going to be battles. And yes, there's going to be difficulties. And there's going to be trials. That won't be happening in heaven. They're all done with that here. But until that point, we are going to have those things. But he's going to be with us. He's going to see us through. His promises to take us through these things and to use them uh, for our good and for his glory will come to pass. We need to remember that. And we see that like we see that here. Again, when the war is raging um, in our lives and in situations, we've all seen and understood and discovered that the Lord was with us and is with us in a special way. And, you know, it takes those days and those battles and those difficulties a lot of the time to see that. I always say, you know, there's a day a person should have in their Christian walk, which is the greatest day and the worst day all wrapped up in one. And, and sadly, Christians don't experience this. And, and most people don't want to. And frankly, almost everybody doesn't want to. But it's such a great thing in a person's life to have the worst day. And I'm not talking, you know, even metaphorically, like, oh, the worst. I had a bad day because the boss yelled at me and the dog, you know, cho- chewed up the furniture and, you know, the kids, uh, you know, broke a window. And, and I'm talking about, you know, where the bottom drops out of everything. And there is nothing left. Everything is gone. And there you are. But in that time of the worst day, it becomes the best day because then you realize Jesus is all that I have. Amen. All that I have left is Jesus. And, and at your despair, but in the, the good day, you realize Jesus is all I need. He's all I need. He's all I have. That's it. Everything is gone. But then that revelation, he's all I need. And again, the greatest and the worst, the worst and the greatest day in life. And we'll close with this. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because the fear of the Jews fell on them. And so it became a great witness to these 127,000 or 127, I'm sorry to say, provinces throughout the Persian Empire, who the Lord was. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray there. Father, we do thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for these studies that you've preserved for us, Lord, and these stories that are so important to, to read through and understand and know and how we can be so encouraged and strengthened and blessed knowing that you're working even when we can't see you which I believe is a lot of the time we're just going through, you know, the day in and out doing this and doing that. And yet you're working and setting things up and doing things and uh, putting everything together for our good because you love us and you care for us and you want the best for us. And you don't spare us uh, from every trial and battle and difficulty, but your promise is to use those to mold us and shape us into those people that Uh, will be prepared and ready and uh, in that place and in our hearts for eternity. And you'll use us along the way and you'll bless many people because of that. And so we do thank you uh, for those things, Lord. And may we just draw closer to you and remember that you're there. You don't leave us or forsake us and that you love us. You'll take care of the threats and the problems and the difficulties and We don't have to retaliate. We can trust in you and knowing that you'll see us through. And we thank you for that. We ask this in Jesus' name.